Hi guys, Will here from W Week Trading and welcome back. If you are new to the channel, please do hit that subscribe button and tap the bell icon so that you don't miss any of the free content that I share with the trading community here on YouTube. So I've literally just been sat having a cup of tea, having some dinner in the living room this afternoon, a second ago, uh, watching some YouTube videos and <laughs> yes, that does show how exciting my day-to-day my -day life is, doesn't it? But I was watching one particular video on one of my favorite YouTube channels, The Compound, and just a few minutes in, up comes one of my favorite trading-related topics, uh, and that's the topic of having a process versus, well, not having a process, just trading blind and, and making decisions based on guesses, predictions, hunches, and so on. And I just found the conversation really fascinating, and I wanted to share it with you all here today. One particular quote that I really loved from this part of the interview that I'm going to share with you was when uh, Jeff Sout, the person being interviewed, formerly of Raymond James, which for those of you who don't know already is an independent investment banking firm, actually said trading is not complicated, which I think for, for many people out there who struggle might sound controversial, might even sound completely false, but just bear in mind that Jeff's been in the market for uh, half a decade now, so you, you can't really deny his, uh, his experience, that's for sure. Anyway, I'll play the clip for you in just a second, and you can also listen in as Jeff walks through the basic framework of his own process and the structure he uses to actually formulate and land on the investment opportunities and the trade opportunities that he actually executes on via his process. He doesn't share the, the secret source, so to speak, obviously, but it's a really fascinating interview, and I'll link to the full interview itself in the description of this video. And just before we dive in, for any of you watching this today who are perhaps slightly newer traders, uh, pay particular attention to when Jeff talks about risk and making absolutely sure that you never take large losses. And I think that part of the conversation will add real value for you too. Right, so with that, let's dive into the clip. Uh, if you do enjoy the video today, it'd be absolutely brilliant if you take just a quick second to hit that thumbs up button. If you would, that'd really help me if that's okay with you. And that aside, let's get into it. And I hope that you all enjoy the clip. So for the people watching, you, when you say you wake up at five and look at markets, let's get specific because I think a lot of uh, investors and traders, especially young ones, they just start with whatever pops up in front of them. They don't have a process. So in other words, if they flip their phone open and Wall Street Journal sent out an alert or CNBC.com sent out an alert, that's how they start their day, reading whatever headline is given to them, rather than say, here's what I do. First, I look at global markets and I look at weekly charts to get us or first I look at what are the, the best 50 performing stocks of the week or whatever. So I would love to hear what, what your process is, the way you look at markets, because doing this for almost five decades, I know you're not randomly just taking the first piece of news that's thrown at you and then starting your morning. So if you could like kind of give um, the viewers a sense of how you do this, I think it would be really valuable. Jeff launches Twitter. He sees what's trending. Yeah. I have no social footprint. I do not do social media. Period. Good for you. We'll take care of that for so, you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I talk to very smart people, like my new firm I'm with, with Capital Wealth Planning down in Naples, a billion-dollar money manager. They have a unique strategy. Um, but I talk to very smart people. And I hear stocks like Avalar that Amy Zhang gave me. Mm -hmm. um, we're having lunch with uh, Mary Lasante, who I've known since she was an II, an institutional all-star uh, in tech at EF Hutton, if that tells you how far back okay. that goes. And she runs the Lasante Small Cap Growth Fund, and she's a terrific investor. And I hear these ideas. And I was a fundamental analyst. And so I, 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 I can spend a half an hour on fact set and decide if I want to start buying this stock and look at the technicals of the stock. And, right. uh, it's, you know, I learned from Peter Lynch, this business is not that complicated. I mean, Peter would ask the most simplistic questions and by doing so derive these unbelievable insights. We, in, in the early 80s, uh, there was a company at Devonshire Street in Boston. Um, we called it Orco. It was optical radiation. They were the first people with implantable lenses. And there were like five uh, newly minted MBAs, Peter Lynch, Bernie Grenfeld, Bruce Johnstone, Beth Toronto. 
And the, the newly minted MBAs were asking all these complicated questions to show everybody how smart they were. And the, the conversation rolled around to Peter, and he said, I just want to know how it works. And after the CEO got done chuckling a little bit, he said, well, Peter, it's really pretty simple. You take the cataract out, you put in the interocular lens, and the cataract didn't come back. Stock went from single digits to 200 in right. two years. Right. So, you're, so your first company. filter is smart people you know. Yes. And, that's, and you'll start with the ideas of people that you say, this person knows what they're talking about. They're, they're saying something to me. Let me start with that. Yeah, well, Tom O'Halloran, right across the river here, uh, over, over in Jersey City at Lord Abbott, I said, I have no social footprint. Yeah. So, but he told me to buy Facebook at 24. Right. And I bought Facebook. So I don't own it currently, but I bought it. Right. So if, if you get a good idea from somebody, that's where you'll begin researching. Yeah, on an individual okay. basis. Now, I have a long-term, an intermediate-term, and a short-term proprietary model. That are, they're not right all the time, but they're, they're right a lot more than they're wrong. I also have a way of measuring the stock market's internal energy. It, it doesn't tell you which way it's going to be released, regrettably, but it tells you there's enough energy that if a move starts, there's enough energy. So what are some of the variables that go into a short, med intermediate, and long-term model? <laughs> like, like without giving away... The trends. Thing, but what What are you looking like at? What volume, are things that trend, are important to you? I'm, I'm looking. Yeah, I'm looking at volume. I'm I'm looking at trends and price trends. Uh, there's a couple of proprietary things like the energy model is very proprietary. My dad you used to I, write about the inner coiled spring of the market. Yeah. I remember that phrase from you. How do you measure that internal potential energy? That's that's the proprietary internal. I almost got in a fist fight with Andrew Ross Sorkin one day. Becky saved it. Saved the day. <laughs> Because he kept saying, well, I don't think it's fair that you come on CNBC and talk about your proprietary models and then not tell us what's in them. <laughs> okay, well, so here's our secret sauce. We no but longer don't be proprietary. Don't tell and, uh, and, and what motivation could you possibly have to do that? None. Right. Who, right. who wins in a fight between uh, Jeff and Sorkin? Sorkin's wily. Yeah. Uh, I, my money's on uh, – I, I would have the money he's on He's like Jeff. me. He's got long arms, though. He's got reach. Yeah, but I he's got know. no power behind it. That's, he's, a uh, smart, he's a smart guy. He sure is. is. Um, well, he asked you the right question, but you don't have to answer it. Um, so when you look at markets, are you first looking at things like economic data, or are you starting with technicals, or you're just trying to understand what's going on? What would be the first thing that you'd look at? Fundamentals, earnings. Okay. And I think the most important thing you can share with your viewers is the, the most important number one rule in this business is to manage risk. If you manage risk, you're not going to take big losses. Okay. So manage, so manage risk mechanically in what sense? Know how much you have at stake at all times and modulate it if, I, you, if I don't, you have too I, much? I don't let anything go against me more than 15 or 20%. Okay. So you stop losses or basically is it just a it's line a mental of sand? stop loss. You, so you're not giving it to the New York no. Stock Exchange, but when something you buy at 100 crosses 80, you're out. I'm out. Do you get frustrated when you know you're right fundamentally, but the market is in bad condition? So it takes you out of a trade that you would otherwise have stuck with? Or have you learned to rise above that? I sensation? rise above that. I, okay. I learned in 1974, you know, stocks can do anything. That's right. 70, 74, we were down 50% from the high? 57 peaks from the 73 peak to the low in 74 was, I think, 57. Um, just about identical to 08, 09. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's what do you make? What do you make of... Um, I've heard four different analogies for this market based on different years. What do you make of this cut? This cut? Like somebody was saying in 1994, they were investigating Whitewater and Bill Clinton decided to start a trade war um, to distract attention. And therefore, this is a very similar setup. I've heard other people say this is Nixon. This is 1973, 74 all over again. Head fake. Like when you hear that stuff and you've actually seen it in real life, do you say – yeah, there are similarities, but I could always find similarities. That's a waste of time. Or do you think there's any value to contextualizing the, the moment that we're in with that stuff? I think it's nonsense. All of it? All of it. Okay. Why do you think people do it? It's just like a human trait to try to match things up? Uh, the media loves it. Pat pattern recognition? The media okay. loves it. Okay. You so, know, so you know. The environment is so different that understanding the geopolitics of one era are, is not really going to help you uh, in the current era? I used to live in Washington, D.C. I, I'm still pretty connected on the, on the Hill. I've never seen D.C. in the shape it's in right now, by the way. Okay. It's, been, it's been turned on its ear. This is the worst you've seen? It's, it's the most unusual I've ever seen. Okay. And I've, I've been observing D.C. since I was 16.
What do you make of this idea that it says the most unusual you've ever seen it, and the stock market is 4% off its all-time high, doesn't seem to care? Is that surprising to you? No, because the, the earnings uh, have been ratcheted down. I think they've been ratcheted down too far. If you look at the chart of the revenues and sales, it keeps tagging new highs. And now unless there's a disconnect, if revenues keep going up, so let's talk about earnings for a minute. You mentioned risk. The second issue, item you mentioned is earnings. We've been hearing, I don't know, for five years, we're at peak earnings, it can't keep growing, it, and once those earnings roll over, the market will, will follow. How much or little attention do you pay to that sort of stuff, and how do you analyze earnings for the S&P 500? Well, we've always used uh, the S&P a bottom-up operating earnings estimate, and it's come down from about 173 to about 168 now. Um, I think they've reduced it too too, too far. In Wait, my, it's in two and a half percent, and you think that's too much? Yeah. Okay. Because I I I think the economy's fine. I think earnings are fine. You you may get a little margin compression, but I don't think you're going to get a lot. Mm -hmm. Right. If 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 the margin compression is coming from rising wages, arguably that's like where you would want to see it. Yeah. Right. Like if if anything, if if you have to choose between that and let's say rising commodity prices, you'd you'd prefer people making more yes, money. Yes, absolutely. Okay. They'll eventually spend it. You'll see more retail sales, yeah. housing, etc. That's right. So as a final question, what's what's the secret to longevity? Um, I'm I'm doing this 21 years. I th I think you're on the street for 30. Almost, not quite. Yeah, okay. coming 25 years. So how do we get to where you are without losing our minds? Like, what would you say is the secret to a long career on the street from what you've seen? Managing risk. Managing risk professionally, not Avo just in dollars. Avo yeah, avoid the big loss. Okay. That's avoid the secret. Avoid the big loss. Okay. So not a, not, a lot of peop not a lot of people make it as long as you have and as far as you have. So you would say it's, it's less about how much upside you generate, but it's more about what you don't give up. Don't, exactly right. Don't blow up. That's exactly don't right. Don't blow up.